well if there's a background rate. If there's some kind of disease or genetic mutation or lethal mutations that Bailey spoke about, you can have a linear form as well. Okay, so part of the things that we worry about the damp, this is another thing called senescence. So that's when you get to sufficiently old, you just dilapid your role, not because anything's an age. Uh, we have age structured age phases, so you don't have to always have one bin represent one year. So Eileen spoke yesterday about the fact that her bins weren't even necessarily the same length all the way through the model. So you can do it, you know, one bin is one year, you can do it, one bin is X number of years, so two years or three years. Or you can actually have the size of those bins shift as you go through it. And the reason that you do that is when you go sit down to write a model about a biological system, or actually any system, you don't have to treat everything at the same resolution. You think about the role that that animal has, or the process is happening. Now what happens in the first year of a fish's life, it can change its diet ten times over in that first year. And then, it, you know, again when it becomes a, a settled animal that's swimming around, and again once it becomes an adult, so that you can chunk up the life history appropriately to capture all those changes. It's also good to have that kind of age structure in there because there's a delay in recovery. So one of the issues around the biomass pool that you have to be really careful about is that because they're not following the age of the animal or the number of the animal, as soon as there's more of it, it can get bigger again. There's no delay in becoming an adult. It can just grow instantaneously. So if you put age structure in there, you have some of the real recovery delays that actually happen. There's also, you can get some of the more subtle effects of overfishing, like having a shrinking size of adult affecting reproduction. And then we can have the stuff I talked about before, or we can have gate. And the reason that we, one of the reasons that we follow the structure and in fact is because the amount you reproduce can be affected by your condition. So by knowing how fat they are, how good quality they are, you know what kind of food they are for a predator, you know how many babies they can have. So there's a lot of reasons to do it. Okay, the other way to do it is transition matrices. This is used still a lot on land. So if you look at the modeling of ecosystems and animals on land, it's actually not as far advanced as it is in the marine world. It seems kind of quite odd to go up and ask them, why haven't you thought about all these other things? Because like, they can go out and measure it. Whereas we do modeling, particularly in Australia, where we can't afford to collect data, so that we can think about what's happening in a place that we can't go on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so you can use transition matrices both for ageing and representing growth in the population, but you can also use it to represent movement between different locations. So we've played a lot already with regular grids, or at least you know, having a grid for every space, but you could actually also represent space as just nodes. So we could have one node for that corner of the room, one node for down here, another node for over there. So we just represent them as three spots. And you just have a transition of how animals move between the spots. When you've got a regular grid, you can have an environment like we've been playing with the net logo. But there's lots of different ways of representing space. And so there's lots of different ways of representing movement. Some of the fancier ones are um, density dependent ones. So if you're feeling crowded, they might want to move or if they can't find enough food, they might want to move. There's whole areas of ecology that fixated on how accidents are moving. Sometimes you're lucky and the fish doesn't actually want to move. So there's lots of reef fish. Once they're on a spot, they stay there for life. The other ones have small territories. So it might be that I'm quite happy to be here. Well, if you think of my teenage daughter, she has her personal space. You can't invade her personal space or you get yelled at. You have to ask permission to give her a hug. Fish are a bit the same. They'll have their personal space, their territory, which they defend quite vigorously if something else comes inside it. One thing that's actually fairly easy, though, which is a benefit, one of the other ones that's quite useful is called a random walk, where the animal just sort of randomly does wander around. But there's some tricks that you can put in there. So when they find, whether you're a shark or a little fish or a human, when you're around a good food source, you tend to tightly, be tightly turn because you want to stay on where you are. When you're about to wander off, they actually do this beautiful, and with pretty much every species that it doesn't, they do a big figure of eight just checking the local area. They can't find anything, then they go. And that's a really simple pattern that follows across pretty much every tropic level of 
There's other aspects to movement. Um, so you've got your day-to-day -day movements, your feeding ones, and then you've got long distance ones. So they might be for reproduction. Most fish don't pair up. Most fish what, do what they call broadcast spawn, so they just release their gametes into the water. But to increase the chances, they all go to a single spot and do it together. So they have to make a dedicated movement. There's nothing quite as sad as being on a coral reef in the Pacific and watching the last lone male go to the spawning location and look around desperately for the females that have all been fish. The other part of it is that you can have a combination of the different methods. So, for instance, in Atlantis, in the non-spawning season, they make feeding movements. In the spawning season, they ignore the food, or some species can ignore the food and just be directed by their imperative to get to the spawning site. The other part is um, there's lots of different mathematical ways of representing that, so you don't have magic teleportation as if they had a TARDIS for those of you who are Doctor Who fans in the audience and leap from one spot to the other spot across thousands of kilometres. There's lots of maths around doing that. There's some learning. So one of the common filters that people use in ensembles to actually see if models fit and try and get them better, you can use that same kind of maths to represent learning. So animals learning what's in their environment, or humans remembering where they caught something a long time ago. The last part of movement is vertical. So animals don't just move like this, they often move like this as well. So they could be looking for food on a daily basis, or they could actually be trying to get away from predators. So lots of animals come to the surface tonight, at night to feed, because then they can't be seen by predators who would have seen them in the day. Next part of the life history is reproduction. So there's lots of ones where you're looking at the effect of reproduction without thinking about the mechanics. And that's sort of the more normal ones, which is the random number. And then there's plankton-based ones where you say, okay, it's a number based on how much plankton is in the model at that location. On the argument that the larvae are themselves plankton, but they also feed on plankton. Then you have ones that stop assessment guys have been using for ages which are actually to do with the number of adults you get roughly this number of offspring. And there's a few of the more common ones there. For things like sharks or whales, you actually have a fixed number of offspring for adults is a more typical way of doing it. You can put in some of the more unusual features, like if there's an environmental driver on that recruitment, so you can have enormous spikes. When you're producing a million eggs, if just a tiny percent more of those get through, you can see an enormous <coughs> increase in the number of recruits that have turned up that year next year. So you can have those kind of effects represented, you can have parental care. So this is a father seahorse and they brood the babies, it's not the mothers in seahorses that do it, so you can represent that kind of investment. This is an example of parental care that I saw up on Ningaloo Reef. This is a humpback whale sitting on top of its mother's back. The reason it was doing that was because the killer whales were trying to eat it. So this mother had actually had twins. She tried putting one of the twins on our boat. The killer whales had taken that. Unfortunately, I was rather glad that they had because my boat was smaller than the whale and I could only see me going in the water with the rest of them. It took, took them about half an hour to get the first cut, and sadly it took them about another six hours to get that cut. So she lost both. But there's a humpback whale mother about every kilometre up on the reef that time of year, it's just everywhere. One of the interactions, thinking back to the human side of things, is seeing how people interact with that. So there's a lot of tourists, they go up to see them, and then you have the head of the local chamber of commerce who wants to cull the whale because they're having accidents with the oil and gas ships moving through the system. So different people have different perspectives on how they think about vertebrates in the system. The other way that you can represent it is you can skip over thinking about the larvae and just say, Right, this many eggs are produced and that translates into this many babies at the other end and they appear and they do everything after they've been in the plankton. That's one easy trick. Or you can actually physically, explicitly represent the larvae moving around. Now, so there's some models that only care about that part of the history, but if you're trying to close the life history, you can also use some other math tricks to represent. So this is a product called Connie that we use in Australia whether it's larvae or an oil spill or whatever other floating thing to worry about. You can define where they come from and it will give you a map of where they're likely to have turned up how far down in the future that you worry about. That. So it's how we, we have a big race down the east coast of Australia every year that ends in Hobart. And if a sailor falls overboard, we actually use this software to figure out where they're going to wash up so we can try and find them. The other part of 
the movement is you can just say, right, I give up. I don't know how they move, but I just want them to be at that location at that time of the year. And that's a trick that's been used in the past just to make sure that particularly prey fish turn up in the right spot at the right time. One of the, it's quite useful, but you have to be a little bit aware when we're moving into these climate scenarios, it's quite likely the fish will shift, and using that force stuff isn't going to work. You can get into some quite complicated movement, so this is starting to get more into Eileen's individual based area that she'll talk about in a minute. But if you do have this kind of seasonal movement, so these are actual tracks of animals and how far they've moved, so you can see that they don't tend to be home bodies, like this one's going from the north to the almost the south pole. And it's really interesting, these turtles will actually you know, reproduce over here, come and feed over here and go back there to reproduce. So they make these enormous migrations. So if you try and include that in the model, there's a couple of things you have to be aware of. It sounds good, so you're trying to make sure everything's in the right spot at the right time to be there to be eaten or to eat something. It can make it quite a juggling exercise, as I'm sure Mike can attest. So one who's still got any hair after trying to do a blank just for the last three years. <laughs> so there's lots of reasons to include this kind of ecology, though, because it links the different parts of the system together. It's one of the coupling mechanisms in nature that you have to think about being important in the model. Okay, so then we get into the really messy part of one of these kind of models. So lots of those models you can just assume they get enough to eat and you can still get the age structure happening. But if you're going to explicitly represent how animals eat, which we'll play with a bit this afternoon in the ecosystem, you have to figure out what they eat in reality. And believe me, that's one of the stinkiest jobs that you'll have to have. So whether you're cutting up stomachs or going through seal poo or whatever else you have to do to figure it out. You end up, there's some things that you can separate out quite easily and go, I don't know what that is. Lots of times you just get this much and you know it's some kind of fish, but you're not exactly what, sure what kind of fish. That's where you can use things like isotopes. So this carbon to nitrogen ratios for particular kinds of ions can actually tell you the sort of the food chain it came from, the area it came from. So you can start to infer some of that kind of stuff. So this is an example of a really well collected diet set from just off Alaska, where over the last 20 odd years they've been collecting all of those locations, the diet. And you can see the different diet changes through time, but also through the different ages. So not all fish eat the same thing through time, or even as they get older. Thinking about those um, different kind of isotopes, you can use it to track where animals live. So this is using isotope signatures. You can tell that where these different animals actually nested, so on the different parts of the islands. And for the animals that you might not find for a couple of years later, that's actually a really handy thing to know. You can also use it to track migration. So this is the whale, the whitehead whales up in the North Pacific. And they use the isotopes to track the fact that they're actually going to different areas to feed at different times and moving about. So that's actually been quite expensive to stick an electronic tracker on, but this is using a signature in their own. You only need a tiniest little pinprick to actually do this kind of work. It's not, it doesn't have to feel good. You can also have quite large shifts in time represented in the model. So this, for example, this is an Atlantis model in one particular box. So you sort of use Grid cell, like I do, is actually use polygons in Atlantis, but in one spot this is the change in shark diet through time. So you can see it was quite variable through time. But you also get quite variable through space as well. Just like any other part, any other model, you actually have to validate it and verify it and all those kind of things. So this is a comparison to that shark diet of the observed stuff in red and the Atlantic stuff in blue. So you can see we got it roughly right. We didn't always get it right. Lobster, Atlantis thinks sharks eat a lot more lobster than the sharks think they eat. So, you know, you can always have something that doesn't quite work. But you tend to learn more when things don't work than when they do. So that's actually a good modelling tip that you should always remember. Just because your model works, you still have to go check it. Because you could be right for the wrong reasons. And that's a step that most people do. Okay, so the kinds of questions that these kinds of uh, vertebrate models are being used to answer. Uh, just basically how you put models together, how the real systems might work, but most of them have been used to ask management questions. What would management look like? How would you sample it? How would, what kind of rules would you use? That kind of stuff. So, for instance, this is a sort of equivalent diagram to 